Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, delighted to uh, come to you today uh, with another live stream presentation. Um, as always, just want to encourage you to utilize your chat box during the uh, presentation and also to sign in uh, your name so that everybody knows uh, who's on board here. So with that, let me open up with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, new day and uh, this opportunity uh, just to utilize uh, this forum uh, to learn more about healthcare uh, so that we can utilize it just to reach uh, people around the world with the gospel. Uh, thank you for Dr. Norman and his willingness to be uh, here today to present in Christ's name. Amen. So today, uh, I'm delighted to present to you Dr. Andy Norman, uh, who is from Lincolnton, Georgia. Uh, he earned his uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and his medical college, uh, or excuse me, his uh, medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia. He served as a medical missionary in Nigeria with the International Mission Board uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention from 1989 to uh, 2002. And in uh, 2013, he retired from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He has significant experience caring for women injured in childbirth. Most recently, he uh, has worked uh, as a uh, vesicovaginal consultant on numerous special assignments with Samaritan's Person World Medical Missions. Uh, so today, I'm uh, again delighted for Dr. Norman to present from vesicovaginal fistula to preventing maternal morbidity and mortality. Dr. Norman. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll just get right, right into the slides and talk about uh, vesicovaginal fistula and about some of the uh, issues in preventing maternal morbidity and mortality, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Ready for slides. Okay, uh, just a disclaimer slide, and you can read the general disclaimers, but I will say that this is a talk about vesicovaginal fistula from medical people, and this, so there will be a few explicit photographs. If uh, you're not okay with that, you can just look the other way. It won't be too much of the program, but just a little bit. So first, what is a vesicovaginal fistula, or a VBF as is commonly abbreviated? It's an abnormal opening between the bladder and the vagina that results in continuous, unremitting urinary incontinence. So uh, technically, vesicovaginal fistula includes a larger, a larger term, which could be something like urogenital fistula or uh, rectogenital fistula, but it, it can in, involve other types of fistulae other than just between the bladder and the vagina. So the typical complaint of a woman with a vesicovaginal fistula is that she leaks all of her urine all the time. So these women leak day and night, uh, no spontaneous uh, urge or ability to urinate at all. What causes obstetric vesicovaginal fistulas, and that would be prolonged obstructed labor. Uh, between the place where the baby's head is entering the maternal pelvis and the vagina uh, becomes necrotic. And when the necrotic tissue break down, it breaks down, it often leaves a hole between the bladder and the vagina that allows an outlet for urine to leak. So this is just a picture that shows what pressure necrosis looks like, a person that's been in labor for too long. And you can see the discolored tissue around the vagina even extending onto the vulva. Uh, this tissue will slough or fade away and, and sometimes that leaves a hole. Vescovagnal fistula came into the public view somewhat in the late uh, 19, or in the mid 1970s when 
Reg and Catherine Hammond started a hospital in Ethiopia for women injured in childbirth or for vescovaginal fistula. And this is just a statement that Reg Hamlin made. He says that uh, to meet these people is profoundly moving. They're mourning the stillbirth of their only baby. They're incontinent of urine. They're ashamed of their offensive smell. They're often uh, spurned or divorced by their husbands. Uh, some are homeless. Mostly they're unemployable except in the fields. They endure, they exist without friends and without hope. At that time, he said, no world charities have ever heard of them. Uh, they bear their sorrows in silent shame. They suffer in isolation and their miseries untreated or utter, lonely, and often lifelong. So this is just an example of a way a patient who comes in with the fistula looks, and often they have a severe reaction around their uh, parts of the body that would be covered by their pads or rags or underwear, uh, just from the cost of burn of urine. I'm going to show a few pictures of just simple vescovaginal fistula. Now, I should have said as part of the disclaimer that uh, the goal of this is probably not to teach somebody to be a fistula surgeon, but to help them know a little bit more about vescovaginal fistula. So I'm going to limit the pictures just to very simple and explicit types of vescovaginal fistula. So the one just pictured was called a juxtaurethral. That just means it's near the urethra or right at the bladder neck. And so that's a, a type of vescovaginal fistula. The next two pictures are of what we call mid-vaginal fistula. That's somewhere between the proximal urethra and the cervix. And in this picture, you can see a sound that's passed through the urethra, urethra and you can see it through the wall of the vagina and the bladder. And so that's a mid-vaginal vescovaginal fistula. The next picture is a very tiny mid-vaginal vescovaginal fistula, and this just shows a sound being passed from the vagina into the bladder through the tiny hole in the bladder and the vagina. And so that's just a diagram of a mid-vaginal vescovaginal fistula. Next is a picture of a juxtacervical vescovaginal fistula. And that just means it's right by the cervix. You'll see that the uh, alice clamps are holding the cervix and that the hole is right adjacent to the cervix. So we call that one juxta cervical or near the cervix, vescovaginal fistula. Next then. Now, just for the interest of surgeons who are watching and have ever uh, been involved in fistula surgery, I'm just going to show you a little bit about how incisions are commonly made. Uh, this would be a very tiny mid-vaginal fistula, and you'll see that the incision starts over the urethra, goes around the edges of the fistula, and then goes uh, a bit up onto the vagina. And the next one is a, 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 li a little bit bigger fistula, and the incisions are made more transversely. Uh, around the fistula and out to the lateral sides of the vagina. And then sometimes to dissect between the vagina and the bladder anteriorly, it helps to create a flap. So I put a dotted line where an ancillary incision can be made. Uh, but this is just the typical incisions and a flap splitting technique. And then this is a juxta cervical fistula. So you'll notice that the bottom incision would be like somebody would make on a start of a vaginal hysterectomy, you know, just separating the bladder from the cervix, then the little circular incision around the edges of the fistula and then extending up toward the urethra so that uh, lateral flaps are created and can be elevated and allow access to the bladder wall. So we're going to kind of shift now, talking a little bit more about general obstetric needs in the world. Obstetric fistula lies along a continuum of problems affecting women's reproductive health, starting with infections and ending with maternal mortality. Because of the disabling nature and dire consequences, uh, social, physical, psychological, spiritual, it is the single most dramatic aftermath of neglected childbirth. So just, uh, you know, the, the people who die in childbirth don't complain, but the people who get fistula 
go to and fro looking for help for somebody to repair the fistula. So to prevent obstetric vesicovaginal fistula is a daunting task. And uh, a, a lot has been done to help us understand the nature of the problem and the things that are lacking. But to provide those things for every woman in labor in the world is daunting. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult. So I will say that vesicovaginal fistula and maternal mortality are closely associated uh, at, at places where you have a lot of mothers dying in childbirth. You will also get a lot of women getting vesicovaginal fistula. Uh, they share a common ideology, which is prolonged obstructed labor. Interventions to prevent one will prevent the other. So if we can help uh, women to get better care and labor delivery, then we'll see a lot less vesicovaginal fistula in the future. Uh, interventions to prevent VVF would also positively affect neonatal morbidity and mortality. Uh, children who are dying in childbirth or shortly after childbirth. Okay. These are the five major causes of maternal morbidity and mortality, and, and particularly in underdeveloped countries. Bleeding is the first one. Obstructed labor is another. Hypertensive problems like preeclampsia and eclampsia is another. Sepsis or infection is another. And then complications of abortion or, or the, uh, is the fifth most common cause of uh, morbidity and mortality in underdeveloped countries. Now, the list of causes would be quite different for developed countries. Uh, some of these things are not often causes. Uh, this is just a kind of list of other morbidities that people get from being in labor too long or from not having good care for childbirth. Uh, I don't know that it would benefit me to read all this, but, uh, but there are other problems that women can have after uh, obstructed labor besides VBF. Just want to uh, shock you with a few statistics. Uh, mostly these come from the WHO, and I'll tell you that they're somewhat old. The latest data I have is from 2010, but about 788 women die in the world every day in labor or around childbirth. That comes up to a total of 288,000 a year in the world. 99.6% of these are in poorly developed countries. And for every woman who dies, there are somewhere like 30 to 100 cases where the mother has injuries in childbirth that, are, that have to be dealt with for years to come. How many of you have heard of Malaysian Air 370? Uh, that was uh, a plane that disappeared after taking off in Malaysia on the 8th of March in 2014. It was a Boeing 777. There were 239 people on board, uh, including passengers and crew. As, as best as known, they all died. In the United States, that was on the headline news from all the major networks for at least 30 days after that. And now we still hear about it on national news if they find a piece of metal in the Pacific or something like that. So it has been world news for four years continually, and it was world news for a month continuously. Just think about this. Now, the number of maternal deaths every day is equivalent to three Boeing 777s crashing full of pregnant women every day with no survivors. When did you last hear that mentioned on ABC or CBS or NBC or Headline News or Fox? Maternal mortality has been called the most neglected tragedy of our time. It's a health statistic with the largest disparity between developed and underdeveloped countries. The chance of a mother dying in childbirth in a country like Nigeria is, is greater than 100 times as high as it would be in America or Western Europe. This gap is even larger than the gap between underdeveloped and developed nations in childhood mortality. 
uh, in the late uh, 1980s, I think, uh, published in the early 90s, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation spent something like $34 million uh, with a group at Columbia University looking into the causes of this in West Africa, uh, the causes of VVF, the causes of maternal mortality. And for the $34 million, we got three things. They said that there are three deadly delays in these countries. There's a delay in deciding to seek care, meaning that the patients don't know to go to a hospital. A delay in arriving at a suitable health care facility, uh, meaning they have no way to get there. And Reg Hamlin said we have two problems, obstructed labor and obstructed transport. And then there's even a delay in receiving appropriate care. When, when these women get to a hospital in their countries, often nothing happens. Uh, in, in many instances, they won't be given a C-section or a, a force of delivery or something like that until a certain amount of money is brought by the family. Sometimes the care is unacceptable to the patients. Uh, they may want the care to be given by a female provider, not a male provider. They have a language barrier, so sometimes there are problems even explaining what the problem is to the people at the hospital. So in, in the short version, I guess you could say that the care at the hospital is either unavailable or unaffordable or unacceptable for the patients. And so even if they get there, nothing is done to help them. So I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on these three things. Uh, they don't know to go. Uh, Delivery is considered a normal process, not something that people would have to go to a hospital for. The women who are affected are not the decision makers, so they can't just decide I'm going to the hospital. Uh, they have to get permission from the men that control the money because they have to go with money for advanced payments. Women fear C-sections. You know, there will be rumors floating like if you, if you go to the hospital, you just get a C-section. Uh, cultural taboos, you know, if you go to the hospital, some man's going to look at your bottom or take off your clothes or something like that. Uh, the, the people taking care of them in the villages are not skilled, and so they don't really even know and understand what's available at the hospital, what's better at the hospital, and so they don't necessarily get good advice. And then the whole thing of a fatalistic worldview and uh, you know, the fatalistic worldview would be just that we as medical providers can't make a difference. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen wherever you are. You know, it's just God's will that you die, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And so these are reasons that people don't seek care in labor and delivery. They have no way to get there, obstructed transport. There are no ambulances or emergency vehicles in many underdeveloped countries that come to rescue people having problems. In many villages, even villages where I spent the night and showed uh, the Jesus film and things like that, there's not a single car or a single taxi in that village. This may be 20, 30 kilometers or you know, 5, 10, 20 miles away from a, a road where you could get a taxi. The roads to these places are sometimes not navigable. You have to just come in, walk in, or on a bicycle or a motorcycle. Some areas are isolated during the rainy season, so there are places where the rivers are too uh, big to ford during the rainy season, and there are no bridges or uh, ferries. Transport can be very expensive, particularly if you're sending somebody to town to bring a taxi to carry somebody to the hospital. And then a lot of the areas in developing countries, they only have market like one day out of four. And so you can only get public buses or service taxis to those places on market day. You can't even get or afford a taxi just on a regular day. And then when they get to the hospital, nothing happens. I mentioned some of these things, but advanced payment is usually required. There can be language and cultural barriers. Uh, bribes can be demanded by the people in the medical records office or even the gate men and things like that. Uh, the hospital might not have any skilled personnel or the skilled personnel might be, might be away on uh, 
holiday or gone for the weekend. The, even the hospital staff has a sort of a fatalistic worldview. And so I watched many midwives that were just sitting and twirling their thumbs in labor, not feeling there was anything they could do to help things along. And then a, a big thing is a failure of infrastructure. You know, people are often sent from one hospital to another, even if they get there, because there's no water, there's no electricity, <clears throat> there are no sterile supplies available. The family may be sent to town to buy gloves and things like that. And so it, it, it just, when they get there, nothing happens. There are also inequalities in healthcare use between uh, developed and underdeveloped countries. Even in underdeveloped countries, the few doctors that there are are concentrated in the capital city or big cities. Uh, there are studies from Nigeria to, to show that people are more prone to take male children to the doctor if they're sick. Male children are fed first and selectively fed better. Female children are less often taken to the doctor. Female children may be selectively malnourished because the, uh, the boys get to eat first, and so a lot of the meat and high-protein things are eaten up before the girls get their turn. Well, when you look at world charities, you know, uh, governments and NGOs, the things that they've done, the things that have been favored to try to help the problem of maternal morbidity and mortality in the world have been, you, you know, the first idea everybody has is if we could just go in and train all the traditional birth attendants or the, you know, we used to call them granny midwives or the local women that help people in childbirth, then everything would just be great. They would refer the patients to a hospital on time. And the truth of it is uh, most of those programs have not been very helpful. The, uh, the, the traditional birth attendants are largely uneducated. They are not medical people. Uh, many of them don't even speak the language that would be spoken at a hospital. They have uh, no medical background, no medical training. And then if they refer the patient away, they may lose their own fee. So uh, little has been gained by training traditional birth attendants. The other thing that, uh, another thing that NGOs and uh, governments have liked is prenatal care or antenatal care. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, programs that try to ensure that every woman gets checked at least four times during the pregnancy. And to a point that is beneficial because if women have malaria or HIV or, you, you know, anemia, those kind of things can be remedied before the person goes into labor. But the problem is that many of the problems are not known until the person goes into labor. And so just antenatal checkups don't solve the problem. The Western mentality has also been that. Uh, that birth control would solve a lot of problems. And, you know, the mentality would go, well, if you can keep a woman from getting pregnant, then she won't die in childbirth or she won't, you know, get an illicit abortion or whatever. The problem is when women in developed countries get married, most of them want to get pregnant. So in the data that we had from Joss, Nigeria, the first 900 BBF patients that we saw, half of them had heard about birth control, but less than 5% had ever used any kind of birth control, either because they didn't want it or because the husbands wouldn't allow it or, or whatever. So uh, birth control has not helped very much. So some of the safe motherhood programmers have... Uh, talked about death prevention from various interventions. And so training traditional birth attendants might prevent 3% of the deaths. That would be three out of 100. Getting antenatal care might prevent 10 or 11% of the deaths. Having health centers where the patients could go free and get uh, medical care and medical advice might help as many as a fourth of the women. Family planning might help about a fourth having a health center and then a hospital where they could be referred, uh, you, meaning that they would have to go a long ways to get a C-section or that sort of thing might help about 60%. Uh, 
and even health centers and rural hospitals can do a C-section 24 hours a day would would only decrease the maternal mortality by about two thirds. Uh, a third would still be left uh, with with just those kinds of care. There is some pretty good evidence that having a skilled attendant at delivery, and that could be a general practitioner that knows how to do C-sections and deliveries. That could be a, a midwife, a, a medically trained nurse midwife, or a, a medical midwife. It could, it could be an OBGYN doctor, ideally. Uh, you see that uh, in, the, in Western countries like North America and Europe, 98 to 99 percent of women get scaled care and labor and delivery. And to be honest about it, the one to two percent that don't choose not to. They could if they wanted to, but they choose to go to birthing farms and places like that. Uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, about 75 percent of women uh, have skilled care for labor and delivery. If you look to Oceania, the Pacific, about half. And if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, it, it's less than half uh, that have access to skilled care for labor and delivery. <coughs> There's just a slide from Southeast Asia, but you, you see that where the green lines are longest, the red lines are shortest. And so in Nepal, only 9% of women get skilled care, skilled care for labor and delivery. And the death rate is 830 per 100,000 deliveries. If you look at Bangladesh, you know, a few more people have access to skilled care and the death rate goes down a bit. And if you go to countries like uh, Democratic uh, Republic of Korea, you know, 100% of people have access to skilled care for labor and delivery. And so their maternal mortality rate is, is almost as low as it is in Western developed countries like Western Europe and North America. So the, the, the big thing is that skilled care seems to be the most important factor. So what will it take to really prevent vesicovaginal fistula and maternal morbidity and mortality? Well, we'll have to have competent and attentive labor and delivery delivery care available, acceptable, affordable, accessible, <coughs> pardon me, and safe C-sections will have to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So the pivotal procedure in vesicovaginal fistula is really a C-section when it's needed. So when somebody has been in labor too long, you know, typically the baby may live till the second day, so maybe 24 to 36 hours. After that, the babies tend to die. And if the woman stays in labor for longer than that, uh, necrotic injuries tend to start to occur. So women that I see with vesicovaginal fistula will, will rarely say they've been in labor less than 24 hours, and many will have been in labor three, four, five days, or even more in some cases. So timely care is very important in labor and delivery. So just a, a few essentials for emergency obstetrics, and I, I'm telling you this list is really short, but you have to have IV fluids, you have to have antibiotics. <clears throat> Probably the most single pivotal thing after skilled care is blood, the availability of uh, blood components or blood transfusions. You need oxytocin drugs, those are drugs that help the uterus to contract to uh, stem the flow of bleeding. You need some kind of anesthesia that's safe. Uh, it can be fairly basic, but it has to be uh, provided by a, a skilled person. Or a, uh, And then you need basic surgical services. You know, there has to be an operating room and somebody who's competent to do a cesarean section. So the bottom line is there's a strong association between the level of maternal mortality and the portion of births that are assisted by a skilled healthcare worker. 
The proportion of births attended by skilled personnel is a key indicator for tracking progress in reducing maternal mortality. So what can be done? It, it's a big problem. Uh, the group at Columbia that did a lot of the research uh, published an article sometime later explaining why very little had been done to help. Uh, <clears throat> you know, for a country like Costa Rica, Sri Lanka, you can have four or five hospitals in the whole country that can do a safe C-section and everybody in the country with a good transport system could get to those places in time. You take a big country like Nigeria or Sudan or, you know, uh, Chad, places like that, and you would literally have to have hundreds, if not thousands of hospitals that could do a safe C-section. And so some people have said that they would even have to be in walking distance of every pregnant woman on the face of the earth. And so these countries just simply don't have the resources or the organization or the infrastructure to have those numbers of hospitals. And the hospitals would really have to provide uh, free care. You know, you can't uh, expect the poorest people to come with a pocket full of money in order to get the C-section that they need in a timely way. So you have to have a skilled attendance at all births. You have to have basic obstetric care in peripheral units, comprehensive emergency obstetric care and referral hospitals have to be has to be rapid transport of the women that need special care. And then after the women have had a baby or two, family planning is, is more acceptable and would need to be available after delivery. Another thing that really probably has to happen is that the women's status has to be improved in some of these developing countries. Uh, the awareness about the consequences of poor maternal care needs to be made known. <clears throat> so rewards maternal morbidity and mortality. This was a statement made by WHO in 1991. Its prevention must ultimately lie in a profound change in the status of women. This change must involve, among other things, recognition of women's value, starting with adequate nutrition in childhood and continuing with access to primary education at a minimum. It must include the eradication of harmful traditional practices like gentle cutting, uh, early marriage. So uh, there must be a way to raise the age of marriage. Uh, women's pelvises don't finish growing until they're about 18 or 19 years old. And so even in developed countries, uh, women having babies at less than that age have an increased incidence of death and C-section. Uh, there must be other ways of women achieving social status besides early childbearing. These are long-term goals. They're not easily achieved, but they're vitally important to women's health and women's lives. <laughs> It's just a quote I found. I, I, I wish I knew the context, but uh, Ralph said, in an unequal world, women are the most unequal amongst the unequaled. What can we do? What can I do? What can you do? Uh, we could assist in the formation or upgrading of a uh, specialized VVF center in a needful place. Uh, these women are the poorest of the poor. They, they usually don't come with money. When you send them to get money, they usually don't come back uh, because they, they have often been rejected by their families, and so the families won't contribute. Uh, we could assist with uh, upgrading emergency obstetric services in needful places, and there are some NGOs that focus on that specifically. Uh, we could spread the word, you know, help the world to know about maternal morbidity and mortality. We could encourage our government agencies to do more and to do more meaningful things. And for each of you, I would say get involved, you know, get involved somewhere, get involved somehow, get involved soon. Uh, if, if you have not done so already and you're a medical person, you should certainly contact uh, World Medical Missions, Meredith's Purse, there are so many opportunities. I couldn't begin to mention them all 
for volunteers, but uh, that is certainly one way that you can become involved. <coughs> Couple of pictures at the end. Uh, you know, I have a lot of OBGYNs and OBGYN residents and fellows in female medicine and rep uh, reconstructive surgery contact me about wanting to go and learn to do VVFs or to see VVFs. Uh, there was a hospital in Northwest Cameron that contacted me about 10 or 15 years ago. And they said, we have a problem here. We can't get doctors. You know, we, we have people with VVF, even workers at our own hospital that have been suffering for years. And we, we have a couple of uh, surgical technicians. Would you come and train them how to do VVFs? We don't even hope that we're going to find fistula surgeons. And so the guy standing at the left back and the guy with the gold hat at the right back uh, spent three weeks with me and a team learning to do VVF surgery. And about five years ago, I bumped into the director of this little hospital and he was telling me that of the procedures they've done over the years, they've had a 75% success rate. Mm. So wow. get involved. And the next picture uh, comes from uh, a recent uh, fistula camp on Mercy ships and uh, on Mercy ship, when the patients have had their surgery and have uh, recovered and are, are now dry or continent again, they have a big uh, Thanksgiving and praise service to uh, praise God for really providing healing and providing care to these women. Uh, they give testimony. Some of the testimonies are extremely touching, but. Uh, Typically, they tell about how many years they've been suffering and all the ways that they've tried to get help unsuccessfully and all the money they've raised and paid it to hospitals that promise help and don't give it. And uh, then they, the funny thing is they start uh, praising God for, you know, for me, a, a sur official surgeon, but also for the nurses. And uh, they even praise God for the drivers and the uh, people that cooked for them while they were in the hospital and the chaplains who came and uh, loved them and told them about Jesus. But uh, this one particular person, uh, when she spoke for full day, which is a language I know a little bit of. And uh, so she, uh, when I would come through the ship at night making rounds, she would ask me how I'm doing. And in the Fulani language, people often say, uh, how's your tiredness? Are you tired? And I'd say, oh, yeah, I'm tired. My neck's killing me. You know, squatting, cleaning down and uh, doing that surgery gets my neck in a real snit. And so she would stand up behind me and start rubbing my neck. And uh, you can look, tell from even this picture that she's a touchy-feely person. You know, even at the uh, dress ceremony when she wanted her picture taken with me, she had her arm all around me and her hand on my shoulder. But uh, Anyway, there's a lot of joy in uh, being able to help these patients. Uh, in one of the, the camps I was in, we uh, helped a lady who had been leaking for 42 years. So she mm -hmm. contracted the VVF when she was a teenager. She had leaked all of her adult life. She was about my age, about 62 or three years old at that time. And uh, so uh, the joy on her face to be able to... Uh, be continent was just amazing. Mm. On the same uh, batch of patients, there was another one that had been licking for 32 years, another one 28 years. So those are not the norm. Most of the patients find help sooner than that. But it, there's a lot of joy in taking somebody who is licking all of her urine all the time and uh, helping to restore continence. So I'm gonna open the floor for questions now. I uh, <clears throat> I want to just mention the last slide, which you'll have access to. I'm not going to read it, but for people that came hoping to learn something about repairing VVFs, there are two VVF repair books by Brian Hancock that are available online. So I put the link to those whole books. One is a uh, first steps in VVF repair book, and one is a more comprehensive text about VVF repair. And then I just noted an article that that. I and others wrote back in uh, 2007 about the problems of uh, trying to prevent obstetric fistula. Uh, there are a lot of other resources that I could probably uh, 
provide if somebody has an interest and wants to contact me. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Norman, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, just a, a real straightforward uh, and well-delivered presentation about BDS. Um, there's tremendous need out there. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's, yeah, just tremendous need. And, and uh, so we do encourage you, our listening audience, to get involved. Um, this is just a great opportunity for me, of course, as the director of World Medical Mission, just to reach out to you. You know, we have uh, nearly 50 partnership hospitals around the world, and uh, we need your help. We need you to get involved as uh, general surgeons or obstetrical surgeons. Um, to uh, volunteer with World Medical Mission because there are so many women around the world in developing countries uh, that have to uh, and present with this problem. As Andy said, this is the morbidity uh, is is dramatic. I mean, these women are you know incontinent and ostracized uh, for years, so it's a real a real problem. Not to mention uh, just the uh, other uh, the mortality rates and so forth associated with uh, obstructive labor, but. Um, so with that, uh, just uh, reach out to you all, our li uh, listening audience, um, to pose any questions to Dr. Norman uh, that you may have at this uh, at this time. Um, don't see any uh, questions right yet, so uh, don't be bashful. Um, encourage you to reach out. Um, just at, while we're um, we're waiting for questions, just wanted to say. Um, uh, you know, I was talking to Dr. Norman before the presentation just about opportunity. Uh, right now, Samaritan's Purse does not have uh, camps dedicated to uh, VDS, but um, just talking about maybe opportunities that we could potentially uh, uh, put that together in the future. Um, I'm sure it would be an incredible ministry opportunity. Um, I do have one question from Ashley. Uh, she says, how do doctors and nurses begin the early steps uh, and actively helping uh, underdeveloped countries change the status of women. May to answer that verbally, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. So, uh, I, as I I think I tried to paint the picture in the lecture, it's 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 very difficult. Uh, in my early days in uh, Nigeria, there was an old OBGYN doctor there, Martha Gilliland, and she told me she said, uh, you know. Most OBGYNs particularly will come to Africa with the hopes of learning to repair vesicovaginal fistula. Uh, she said, I think it's, she told me, she said, I think it's immoral, immoral for a doctor to be re repairing vesicovaginal fistula that's doing nothing to prevent them. Mm. And so in the years that I was in Nigeria as a full-time missionary, I worked in a training program, training uh, young doctors and supervising nurse midwives. And so the whole point of that was to train them to give attentive care to women in labor and delivery and to back them up with uh, the, the unusual kinds of things. And so I think that prevention is, is a greater goal or a greater call than just doing repairs. Repairs make a a, a tremendous difference in the life of an individual who's been isolated and mm -hmm. suffering, but uh, trying to prevent these problems is is the more important thing. And so I think that anywhere you can get involved uh, helping young people learn to take attentive care and labor, uh, to, to give attentive care and labor and delivery will ultimately make some difference. Yeah. Um, I think there's so many ways to get involved. Almost every hospital at Samaritan's First World Medical Missions sends volunteers to uh, has obstetric units. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one time uh, one of the doctors told me that I should go to a certain hospital that I could do 80 C-sections in a three-week visit. And I said, good Lord, that's the last thing I want to do is 80 C-sections <laughs> in a three-week period. But uh, when you have somebody along to teach, you know, learning to do a C-section is, it's literally pivotal, pivotal, mm -hmm. you know, but having people in labor and delivery that can recognize a woman who's not making the desired progress and literally rescue the baby while the baby's still alive and 
stop the process of labor, which can be disastrous if continued for days on end, I think that's making a difference. And so those are the things I would try to look toward doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I started to uh, say, um, Dr. Norman, as a, I'm an internist, so as a non-surgeon, what are some practical ways that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, non-surgeon clinical clinicians could get involved? I think you've already answered one of them, certainly prevention's the name of the game. So. Yeah. So, you know, I think that a lot of times the, the non-surgical people have a, a greater propensity to get involved in hospital administration and things like that. And just having hospitals where people can get attentive care and can get it as quickly as it's needed and then uh, sort out the uh, payment things and all later, I think is the most important thing I can say. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, your colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Sawyer says, thank you, Dr. Norman. Of course, the scope of this problem is enormous. Thank you for sharing your expertise and for giving yourself uh, to those women for the glory of God. So we do thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, and thank you, too. Um, so I don't see any more questions. Just a uh, last opportunity here. Um, while we're waiting for that, I uh, just want to remind you um, uh, about CME credit uh, for this session. The form and instructions are in your email. Uh, and we'll, we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording for this and also make sure that you look on um, uh, that uh, email for other um, uh, recordings that, uh, that we ho ho have uh, stored in our archives. Um, if you're not already on the email list, um, you can join the forum at health.samaritansfirst.org. Uh, and uh, also you can learn from that uh, just to, to learn about um, opportunities, uh, upcoming events. I'll take this opportunity to encourage you to participate in PFR, Prescription uh, for Renewal, which will be at the Cove in Asheville, North Carolina uh, in October. Uh, great uh, conference, the medical conference uh, for Samaritan's Purse. So love for you guys to join us there. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata and Jim Simbola will be our guest speakers at that medical conference. Our next webinar will be Wednesday, August the 8th. Uh, our own Julie Tanaka and Kelly Nam uh, will present infant and young child feeding uh, in emergencies in northern Iraq. So that'll be a great uh, opportunity to learn more about uh, pediatric uh, feeding and um, uh, malnourished children. So um, got one more comment here, um, Dr. Norman. Uh, Rob Ratcliffe says, thanks, great presentation. Uh, the BDFs that we see are more commonly due to radiotherapy, and we, the urologists, often repair them via an abdominal approach. Is that ever needed in the VVS you see uh, from obstetrical trauma? So the, the short answer would be yes, it, it's needed sometimes. Uh, obstetric fistula can be repaired through the vagina about 90% of the time. Uh, I think sometimes uh, urogynecologic and gynecologic surgeons uh, are more comfortable in that route. Uh, in fact, when I first went to Nigeria, a, a urologist who became a great fistula surgeon and did a lot for the cause of BVF uh, asked me to come and show him how to do some vaginally. And uh, I, I did show him how to do some of the dissections and he, he became a a director of a program that repaired about 900 over a nine-year period and then uh, has been involved in the BBF uh, world pretty much for all of his career. So I think that uh, we need to, you know, learn how to get out of our comfort zones. Uh, I tell people sometimes that the first uh, ureteral neocystostomy I ever did, I ever saw, I did, because uh, there was an obstructed ureter and I all I had was a book, and I just went and did about a book. And some years later, the urologist that I worked with told me that, oh, you don't really need to do these uh, uh, submucosal tunnels and all that anymore. And so it, it got a little bit easier with the help of urologists. But uh, anyway, and then another time I was in uh, South America, and uh, a, a, a urology resident asked me to come and help with a, a vault vesicovaginal fistula, not a, not a radiation one. And so we did it. it. Took about 
35 or 40 minutes. And so he said, wow. He said, the last one of these I did with a urologist this training me took seven hours. Uh, so, you know, yeah, most of them can be done vaginally, but not, not all the ones that uh, are, are very complex can be. Okay. Well, thank you uh, again, uh, Dr. Norman. Uh, awesome presentation. And uh, we just appreciate you all joining us here on the forum. And again, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you uh, next month, August the 8th, uh, for our next presentation. God bless.